Hello, Jeff Koons. It's a great pleasure to follow you today in this exhibition at Le Musem, in which you're uh, showing a group of works that were made from 1981 to 2016, so almost 40 years of uh, creation, all works that were uh, lended by the Pinot collection to the Musem. And they are shown in a dialogue with uh, some objects of the collection of the Musem that you chose, some everyday life objects, some photographs, some ritual objects. I was wondering whether you were familiar with the collection of the Musem, previously the collection of the Musée des Arts et Traditions Populaires in Paris, or with the other museum collections of the same type. When I uh, came and visited the museum to, uh, when we spoke about the exhibition, that was really the first time that I ever saw the collection. But within my own life, uh, growing up, uh, there was a similar museum, much smaller in uh, scope than Musem. But in my hometown in uh, York, Pennsylvania, it was an historical society, and they had a collection of, uh, memorabilia to the history of York. And so as a young child, that was the museum that I interacted with. And I think that it helps support my love of objects and of, of looking at things that are part of a community and having a little awe and wonderment. I think your father had a furniture store, and it's well known that you are inspired uh, by uh, very simple everyday life objects as well as by high, what is called high art. Uh, in this dialogue uh, between your works and the collections of the Musem, what do you intend to show? It seems that you're uh, playing with the idea of the ready-made by Marcel Duchamp. You know, if I think of my history with the ready-made, uh, I think my father having his furniture store and my father also teaching me aesthetics as a child. Uh, you know, from my father I saw that colors can affect your emotions, textures, uh, everything can affect the way you feel. And I think my father also taught me the importance of caring. You know, caring is an interesting uh, word, but uh, my father cared. He cared about people. Uh, he cared about uh, objects and, uh, and putting thought into things. And so I, I'm really grateful for that uh, experience. So, but I picked up that in my father's store, objects would just be displaying themselves. You know, a lamp would just be there in, in display or, or an ashtray or, a, you know, an object. So when I started to become involved with uh, the ideas of the ready-made and uh, Duchamp's uh, work, I really thought back to my own history and how my interaction with certain objects, I think, uh, helped me identify with myself, gave me a sense of, of who I am, what my background consists of, and I, a dialogue of acceptance, of being able to accept myself, I would be working with metaphors of objects that, uh, uh, that kind of represented my own cultural history, but are kind of standing in in many ways for everyone's cultural history, that no matter what it is, that history has been perfect. It can't be changed, it's what we've experienced. And it's really about this moment uh, forward. Uh, this uh, artwork of mine, the travel bar, really is a representative of my experience of my parents. Uh, my parents had a travel bar in the 60s, and when they would go on vacation with their friends, they would always take it with them. And it was a symbol for social mobility. If you were a young middle-class family, and if you were a person and you were kind of on your way, you would maybe have a travel bar. You could take uh, alcohol with you. It was kind of a symbol in America of uh, a moving upward. Let's now listen to Emilie Girard, who's a co-curator of the show, and she will show us the storage in which you made this collection, in which you discovered the collection of the Musem. 
Bonjour, bienvenue. On est au Centre de conservation et de ressources du Mucem, qui sont un peu les, les coulisses euh, de, de, de l'établissement, du musée. Et là, donc, on va rentrer dans la réserve qui a été un peu le, dire, la première prise de connaissance par Jeff Koons de nos collections, puisque c'est notre appartement témoin, donc c'est la visite qu'on fait visiter quand on a des invités ou du public. Et on lui a montré donc, cet espace-là, euh, qui crée un peu l'effet « waouh » quand on arrive pour la première fois, parce qu'on on voit tout de suite la variété des collections, leur richesse, leur nombre. Euh, donc on s'aperçoit tout de suite un peu de la, de la nature et de, de l'ampleur de, de ce fond. Et c'est donc comme ça qu'on a commencé notre première séance de travail avec Jeff Koons pour lui montrer quels étaient les objets qu'on qu conservait, comment est-ce qu'on les conservait, ce qu'on pouvait faire avec, quelles étaient les typologies. Donc on a commencé à travailler avec lui comme ça. Et puis petit à petit, on a échangé, lorsque Jeff Koons est reparti aux États-Unis, échangé avec lui en lui envoyant des propositions euh, auxquelles il réagissait, en nous demandant d'aller plus loin. On a commencé comme ça à établir, à construire une liste d'œuvres, petit à petit. Et Jeff Koons est revenu un an après cette première rencontre qui donc avait eu lieu en février 2019. Il est revenu en tout début février 2020 pour continuer à affiner les choix, à voir quel type d'objet il pouvait mettre en relation avec son travail, à réagir à nos propositions. Et sur place, on a continué comme ça à affiner les choses et à trouver des idées qui n'étaient pas forcément évidentes sur le papier. On bloquait sur certains objets, où on, voilà, on se posait des questions. Ça a été le cas de Moon et on va aller voir euh, un petit peu plus loin comment est-ce qu'on a résolu ce problème grâce à l'œil de l'artiste qui a trouvé la solution finalement en voyant les objets sur place. Allons-y Alors on était comme ça en train de se promener comme on, comme on le fait aujourd'hui dans, dans les réserves, dans les allées. Et puis on a ouvert cette allée des instruments de musique. On a regardé un petit peu les choses. Et là, Jeff nous a dit, ah, est-ce qu'on pourrait, euh, est qu pourrait voir les tambours Donc on a sorti l'ensemble des tambours. On les a posés à place sur une grande table. Et là, il nous a demandé de les porter à bout de bras. Et, et il a eu voilà, cet œil, son œil artistique a vu ça. Il a dit, tu vois, on va faire une composition sur le mur comme une lune qui monte progressivement dans le ciel. Et c'est ce qu'on voit dans, dans la salle 6 de l'exposition aujourd'hui, à partir voilà, de cet arrêt un petit peu au hasard, au détour d'une allée, de l'idée qu'il a eu de jouer non pas sur l'usage de l'objet, mais sur sa forme. Là, on est dans la réserve, dans une des grandes réserves destinées aux objets de plus grand gabarit, que ce soit les objets du monde agricole ou les objets du, du, monde, du monde forain, avec euh, par exemple ici un des objets peut-être les plus spectaculaires en termes de dimension, puisque c'est ce char de carnaval de Nice qu'on a remonté dans la réserve de manière à le conserver dans les, dans les meilleures conditions possibles. Et puis, on a travaillé ici avec Jeff Koons, en particulier autour de la collection d'art forain, devant laquelle on arrive ici, qui est présente dans l'exposition. On a eu l'occasion de travailler avec lui euh, au choix des sujets de manège en particulier, qu'on va retrouver dans l'exposition, parce que euh, les sujets de manège, c'est quelque chose qui, euh, assez naturellement, est venu en écho euh, au travail de Jeff Koons, à son bestiaire. Hein, bon, il travaille beaucoup la figure animale, et peut-être que Balloon Dog est euh, la pièce la plus iconique en la matière. So we are now in the room of the balloon dog, a masterpiece of the, the exhibition, surrounded by a large photographs of a clown, Mimil, who's blowing in a balloon at the Cirque d'Hiver in 1960. It's a picture taken by Pierre Soulier, and there's also masks uh, which belong to the Fratellini brothers. Tell me about the balloon dog. It's looks like a children toy and at the same time it also look, looks a little bit like a warrior. Um, is it the kind of duality that you intended to show with this piece? You know I, I, I think so. I think that duality is very important but I, I wanted to make something that would let us feel connected to our, our past and to tie us to our biological memory. I mean, we carry so much information in our genes and our DNA, and we can connect to that biological memory. And so the, uh, you know, the balloon dog, it has a membrane, just like we have a membrane, we have skin. And so you have this dialogue of the inside and the outside. And many of the objects that you'll see in the, that have been chosen from uh, the museum are dealing with aspects of, of being a vessel and, 
basically the way we work with design has a lot to do with our understanding of biology and the human body. And so there are aspects here that the, the balloon dog, yes, it's very externalized. It can be a very trivial type object that's made for a celebration of a party out of this uh, membrane of, of uh, like a, a thin uh, a rubber. But at the same time, you could look at it and it could be made from intestine. It could come from within us, within our body. And I can imagine in ancient times, maybe uh, primitive uh, people would see their kill and they would notice that the gases were kind of getting larger and expanding the intestines in the stomach and that they would have made something like this. And it has a ritualistic quality to it where you could imagine a whole community would be partaking in some type of ritual. How did you choose its uh, size, monumental size? How did you, did you choose its color and the material that you used? Uh, yes, I mean, in making uh, uh, the work, I, I, I thought the size was interesting compared to our own uh, body. And the colors, uh, I made each one's unique. There are five uh, balloon dogs. Each is unique in its color. But uh, just what I was mentioning before about this anthropomorphic quality and the idea that it could come from profoundly within us, like biological memory, the history of what it means to be human from being like a single cell organism to what we are today. If you look at the, uh, the clown blowing up uh, the balloon, you can see it looks like it could be a stomach. It, it, uh, it could be a biological part. I understand you were extremely involved in the scenography of the exhibition, in the way the works are hung, in the choice of the materials used in the, uh, to show the works. How did you decide to position the balloon dog in regards of the hanging hearts? It was a collaboration. So uh, working together with the co-curators, with uh, Elena Juna and with uh, Emily uh, Gerard, is, really been a tremendous joy, the graphics, a tremendous uh, collaborative. But uh, yeah, there are a lot of decisions in uh, making an exhibition like this and different ideas would be brought forward. I would look at them and you know, embrace uh, uh, different ideas and sometimes make different recommendations that you know, could this happen or that happen. But uh, we laid out the rooms somewhat, somewhat chronologically uh, and uh, and actually that is uh, kind of taking place, but also keeping in mind the flow of different objects. And we wanted the pathway, the way you would move through it to be interesting, a sense of uh, openness. Let's go see the hanging hearts. This, uh, this object is um, at the same time a romantic object and also uh, a spiritual object. It was uh, inspired to you by uh, a decorative uh, object that you saw in the window of a pharmacy. How do you relate it to the series of ex photos that you chose in the collection and that are surrounding us? You know, it's wonderful to see the hanging heart uh, in Museum because yes, its history uh, comes from just being an everyday object that was in a pharmacy. I also like that connection to Duchamp's uh, uh, pharmacy uh, 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 painting. But the, you know, the history of, of the heart is also, it's tied very much to the body. And uh, you know, we think of the, uh, the heart of as, as far as blood, but it's also uh, connected to uh, the idea of reproduction and of, uh, of human form. And, uh, and at the same time to this very uh, ethereal uh, idea of, uh, of transcendence, of, of spirituality. So the, uh, the ex photos, you can get the essence of the body. You can look at these shapes here and you can see that you know, this is a feminine form. I mean, there are many uh, sculptures, African sculptures, that look very, very similar to this. They're really defining a feminine form. If you look at all the different hearts, and again, they're, 
they're representing uh, desire and uh, uh, spiritual and uh, good wishes for uh, kind of success, success and uh, healthy bodies. But at the same time, they're really very, very uh, based in, in aspects of, of, of human form and uh, uh, the continuation of, of, of the biological uh, life. According to which criteria did you uh, choose those objects in the collection? What was, what, was there a kind of a methodology? I, w I would just look at everything. So uh, in, in dealing with the heart, I wanted to see everything that was dealing with the, the idea of the uh, heart shape. Uh, in life, you know, if we think about what we do and how we connect ourselves, what we have is our interests. And there's nothing more joyful than just following our interests. And if we focus on our interests and just follow them and really stay focused on that, it connects us to uh, a universal vocabulary. It's very metaphysical, time and space bend, but uh, it's that way for all of us, every person, if we just focus on our interests. And that's what I tried to do. We will now listen to Elena Jeuna, who's a co-curator uh, of the show and whom you have uh, worked with for many years. She will relate this exhibition to some of your previous shows. Travailler avec Jeff, c'est toujours enthousiasmant, passionnant. Il a une énergie incroyable et on découvre avec lui toujours des nouvelles pistes. Quand on était à Naples, c'était un dialogue à l'intérieur du Museo Archéologico et c'était une rétrospective. Donc les œuvres dialoguaient avec le classicisme et le statuaire. Mais par exemple, si on pense au Travolbar que vous avez rencontré plus tôt, euh, il dialoguait avec des autres œuvres de la série Luxury and Degradation, tandis qu'à Marseille, il nous parle face à la mer avec des pichets de barbotines magnifiques de la collection de Sergemine. À Versailles, en 2008, on était chez le Roi Soleil, la plus grande résidence au monde et la plus visitée. Au premier étage, dans les appartements du Roi, on avait le Balloon Dog qui nous ouvrait l'exposition d'un sa euh, présence majestueuse et royale. Tandis qu'ici, vous l'avez rencontré au début du parcours, et il a toute une autre présence. Il dialogue avec les photos du clown Mimili, de souliers qui ressortent du fond souris et avec les images et les masques des frères Fratellini et des clowns. Et donc, on a un côté ludique, infantin, qui devient le fil rouge de cette exposition. C'est la joie, la joie de la découverte et le bonheur de mettre en relation des objets de quotidien, des objets de l'homme, faits par l'homme, au fait qui sont au même niveau, à la même hiérarchie que les magnifiques œuvres d'art de l'artiste. Nous sommes presque entrés dans un circus tent ici. Nous sommes surrounded by some acrobats. Et il y a ce costume d'un clown avec une embroidery de Popeye, le ladder and the lobster as an acrobat also. What does actually circus mean to you? What I really love about this room and putting these uh, images and objects in uh, juxtaposition is the, the kind of the role and the change of role between the performer and uh, the audience. And this kind of back and forth, it's like inside and uh, outside, uh, masculine, feminine. And if we look at different objects uh, and the design that goes into many things that are in the collection of Musem, we designed uh, based on our understanding of, uh, of physics and uh, biology. And so kind of bioengineering, you know, begins with making jugs and pots and all, all of these different uh, vessels and, and objects, tools. And so it's our understanding of the body and how it works that enters into our design. 
we're not really conscious of it, but it's our understanding of how to hold something or the way something can travel through and have uh, the way membranes function. So I think this room, in a way, returns us back to the body. And what's important in life is our understanding of ourself and how we can accept ourselves. And then once we're able to have self-acceptance, how we're able to go out in the world and we can accept other people. And having a dialogue with objects and different things, it's all metaphor for self-acceptance and then the ability to accept other people. And with this idea of transformation, of metamorphosis, do you, are you playing with the idea of creation is, in other words, is the uh, lobster here on the circus track like a figure of the artist? Uh, I, I mean, I think the lobster is here kind of representing everybody. It's, uh, and it's representing kind of a reflection of society and uh, what we look for from society. And at the same time, you know, we are a, a part of that, even though that something can be singular out and viewed at one moment as uh, its own identity. It's also kind of part of the mass. Uh, I think transcendence is a dialogue. I love the idea of becoming, and I enjoy philosophy, and at the core of philosophy, it's really about becoming, continuing to be able to transform, to become a better person, a better human being, uh, have greater understanding, a higher level of consciousness. And uh, I like also the lobster very much for its uh, association that, you know, it's uh, a crustacean. It uh, comes from the bottom. And it's looked at as uh, uh, being from the bottom, but be can be presented in uh, a high uh, manner. And it can walk the, uh, the tightrope. It can, you know, uh, be on the, uh, uh, the trapeze. Uh, to me, also, it represents Salvador Dali with the, the mustache and uh, uh, the tentacles up like that. But also, it's like uh, Picabia and Duchamp's L-H-O-O-Q, you know, with uh, drawing the mustache on the Mona Lisa. Because the form is both masculine and feminine. You know, with the hands out like this, it tends to be quite masculine. And you could see the, the whole body as a phallus. But at the same time, uh, the body could be, uh, you know, uh, the womb, and the arms are like the fallopian tube. Uh, or you could look at the tail, and the tail's like a feather that maybe a, a female performer would do a feather dance with. Yeah. It has these polarities. Let's go to the last stop of our promenade. Bluebird planter. There's a there's an extremely close dialogue in this room between your work and the architecture of uh, the museum. This bird is like an invitation to look outside to uh, the greater world, isn't it? You know, it's beautiful in the design of the exhibition that some of the exterior walls were removed from within inside uh, the building, so you could see through the. Uh, the architecture to outside. You could really enjoy the building and that the sea and the light comes into the space. A reflective sculpture like the bluebird loves light. And uh, so it, when the light is on it, it can reflect and it can uh, really show all of its colors. But a piece like the bluebird is really the inorganic and the organic together because you have you know, there's biological life there. You have these flowers that are live growing flowers. They happen to be wild flowers from the local area that are uh, brought and uh, uh, planted into the, uh, the bluebird. And you have this sense of a life cycle because flowers are a symbol of hope. They're growing and uh, it's life's energy. But at the same time, there is some aspect of funerary uh, 
reference uh, to a piece like this. It's a complete uh, life cycle. The transcending that takes place in you know, the writings of Ovid and uh, within mythology and the, uh, the aspect of birds in uh, mythology, I wanted to try to tap into in a work like uh, Bluebird. Uh, Which sense. belongs to the series Antiquity. That's correct. It's from the uh, Antiquity series. But there, it comes from a small ceramic, you know, ready-made object that would normally maybe be about six, seven inches maximum uh, in length. And of course, you know, it's filled, it's filled with earth. So you could imagine that this could also in some way be, uh, uh, it's, I don't know, it's kind of womb-like at the same time and funerary. And it conveys uh, an amazing uh, strength mm -hmm. and also an impression of fragility. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. And the, the competition of um, the kind of biological uh, world and, you know, our, our man-made world, our synthetic world, like the beauty of that flower, the scale, the color, its presence, its reflectivity, and how it challenges uh, the natural flower and vice versa, how they challenge these tensions. And how, uh, I guess, art is always trying to uh, imitate life and challenging uh, a life. It's, it's this continual uh, becoming, this uh, desire for transcending. This work is exhibited uh, together with some bird calls, some little toys, and roof decorations from the collection of the Musem. So again, objects from everyday life, which you often um, compare to the shades in Plato's cave. As a conclusion, could you tell us a little bit more about that? I don't know about these objects in particular to uh, Plato's cave, but the, the whole idea of being able to walk out of that cave, to be unshackled, I think is through the removal of judgment and through acceptance. And if we do not make judgments, if we accept everything as being perfect in its own uh, being, uh, Everything opens up. We empower ourselves. Everything is a tool to be worked with, incorporated, used. But as soon as we make judgments, we segregate and we disempower ourselves because it's really no longer available uh, to us to kind of be incorporated. And that removal of judgment removes anxiety. And that's how we can open ourselves up to really be interacting with the world and to be free with our consciousness. I think something that's really interesting here, when I mentioned before about kind of bioengineering, if you look at these bird calls, uh, so much of this information is based on the human body. I mean, these could be, you know, like arteries. You look at the how it's hollowed and the way the wind blows uh, through it, the air. You look at Leonardo's work and his study of uh, fluid dynamics and that the power of the Mona Lisa is really through the study of the flow of blood through the body and that when we look at it and look at the curls in the hair, Walter Isaacson has written about that this is where the power of the Mona Lisa comes. We're really looking at the bioengineering of that painting based on kind of the human body. And we're really looking at similar things here uh, and how it's, it's in almost everything that we design. I think that's kind of captured in this case. Thank you very much, Jeff Koontz, for showing us this exhibition at Le Museum. Thank you. <laughs>